one. Good afternoon and welcome to the latest edition of the 18 Bad Guys uh, documentary where we look back on the iconic uh, TV action com comedy series uh, where no one actually met their demise in the five seasons. That's right, we're talking about the iconic sort of military comedy sort of show which was uh, the A-Team which spanned all across all, uh, across the United States and Canada and global uh, global sort of a TV sort of show which went global. It was a cable show that was beamed in every sort of home in the United States and Canada throughout the 1980s and uh, for this week's episode of the Bad Guys uh, documentary we go to season 4, we go to episode 13. The episode was called um Season four, episode nine, actually, and the season, uh, the episode was called Mind Games, and it's got to deal with uh, Dirk Benedict is given a pardon for his role on the A team, and uh, he's almost coming out in terms of trying to live that sort of spotlight, sort of figure, and one of the characters he meets uh, sort of sells him a story in terms of trying to be his publicist and uh, writes to his sort of biography and tries to try to strike a deal with him. That character was called E.G. Fowler, and it was played by the one and only uh, Sheila McLeod. Uh, Sheila, an absolute pleasure, and thank you, thank you for joining us today. Nice to see you, Jim. Nice to see you. Sheila, just first of all, uh, an English actress, uh, how did you find yourself out in uh, Los Angeles and uh, California back in 19, the 1980s, and particularly uh, in 1985? Well, I actually... Um... I had never ever wanted to go to Los Angeles. I, it hadn't been on my radar. It was just, I was one of those actors. I was happy doing theater and TV and stuff. And I was in Canada doing um, a series and the producer said to me, you know, you should go to LA. And I was, so, I, and then a friend of mine said, I'm going down to LA, do you want to come? I have one of my best friends, Mimi Kuzik. And I went, yeah, sure, go down. Not even really knowing where it was to be honest. I was just, I was just uh, you know, out at the ferries and uh, I ended up living there for eight and a half years. And it was such a learning curve, Jim, because you know, over there, I, I really learned so much about the, the graft of being an actor. And um, mm. the, the American actors, or you know, the Canadian actors and of course the British actors, but at that time, the American actors work so hard. They work so hard. You know, they're yeah. doing waiting tables in the in the day, and they're running to auditions. And you're chucked to script, and you're meant to know the lines in, you know, twelve hours. And auditioning, and we're driving all over LA, and I had this crappy old car that was always breaking down, and very little money. And but happy, happy as Larry, really. And um, then I, my agent, I had a very, very good agent, and she said, "Look, there's a nice part for you." in this show called The A-Team. So I just strolled along for the audition with a thousand other actresses and I was lucky enough to get chosen. I, I was thrilled, really thrilled. And you mentioned uh, living there in uh, Los Angeles, California for the eight years. And obviously this was season four. And by then, A-Team was a, a global phenomenon in terms of the United States and Canada. And uh, I know it was a sorry, you have to be into that sort of uh, type show. But had you heard about it when this, when the, your agent mentioned you? Did the A-Team, did that try ring bells straight away in oh, your yeah. head? In terms of yeah, yeah, absolutely it did. I mean, you know, I, I hadn't, to be honest, I kind of watched a bit of it and always loved it when I saw it. I caught it and thought, oh, it was a fun show and it was, it was well written and it was the characters were great. But I'd never like been an avid fan. Hmm. But um, so so I was very aware of the show. But but I I guess I didn't realize till I actually was filming the episode what an iconic show it was and how massively popular it was and how fans just just loved this show. Loved it. And Sheila, in terms of being a slick operation, obviously it was a big budget sort of operation. Everything was done there to a fine T in terms of its professionalism. So when you arrived on set, did you get that feeling that this, I know the stunt teams was one of the best in the business in, in terms of the 1980s, they're probably one of the best stunt teams uh, in USA at the moment. Did you get to feel walking on that sort of set that you were coming into a real sort of slick operation? Completely. It was a, a game changer for me because they had stunts, they had a jetpack and I'd never seen a jetpack and there were only two guys in the States. And I remember, I think it was George Papard took me onto the set and said, Sheila, watch this. And, and there was this guy flying around in the jetpack in that scene. And, and I was just like mesmerized. This was the real Hollywood dream, you know, there were yeah. 
car crashes and chases and you know jetpacks and the, it was really really amazing i loved it i loved shooting it and uh eg uh in terms of the the character eg sort of bowler um she was a sort of a publicist she, she she sort of played that sort of a uh, secret agent type role in terms of uh, being this uh, undercover sort of co-op mission, portraying this sort of uh, publicist, this wannabe aspiring sort of writer, this sort of budding type uh, sort of journalist uh, sort of such. And she played on maybe um, Templeton's and Dirk's uh, sort of uh, temptation of women. He's sort of flirtiness nature that he couldn't say no to a good looking woman that uh, trying to be on his shoulder at all times. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's funny, I had to rewatch the episode to dig out the episode because I completely, I'd remembered parts of it, but I yeah. thought, I forgot, you know, what my role was, but, um, and I watched it again the other night and uh, yeah, she's, she's, um, she's a bad girl, it goes good really. But yeah. I, she was always quite a nice character. She was always very fond of Face as he was called and, mm -hmm. and, and all the other characters. And, and, um, and you know, it was a lovely character to play because it was a big guest role. And actually mm -hmm. on my first day of shooting, the director, Michael Hurley, I think his name was, um, lovely guy, I was so nervous. And on my first shot was actually walking up to um, Temp and having my first speech. And I was wearing these really high shoes and they were really pointy. And I kind of hit my, my top of my shoe hit the pavement. I kind of rocked and they had to, they had to cut the take. And I thought, oh God, here we go. I'm gonna fall over next. But, but it, was, um, it was really fun role. And in the end she comes good and she does the right thing and, and ends up being courted by both of them actually, yeah. And uh, Sheila, in terms of uh, working with sort of Dirk uh, Benedict, I know he comes across as sort of a sleek, uh, polished actor, but people say off the set uh, he's quite uh, polite, uh, quite shy in types of nature, a good sort of atmosphere, but he's very sort of different to the character that he p p portrays, a sort of quite sort of a, a man that sort of keeps his emotions uh, but, uh, to himself, but a uh, very sort of a gentle sort of nature. He was, I mean, I, I mean, I only did one episode and I was lucky enough to do that, but he was a lovely guy. I mean, I remember, I remember the final scene I was in and we had a really good giggle. Um, you know, he is, he's quite reserved, but he's such a lovely man. You know, he's a really sincere, I remember him being a really sincere guy. And um, I, got, I got on well with all of them, actually. And in the end, we did, we started to giggle quite a lot, um, you know, because, um, you know, I only became an actor so that I could act like a five-year-old for the rest of my life. So, and I and I think he kind of, he played along and he, he was nice. He was a nice guy. Yeah. And Sheila, it's important to note as well, um, I just, the name is sort of slipping my head there, but the guy who played the lead sort of CI agent uh, role was actually uh, sort of appeared uh, on the James Bond uh, movie as well, Licence to Kill, yeah. where he played Felix sort of Lightyear as well. Sort of. I wrote his name down, David Vaughan, David Vaughan. David Vaughan, David yeah. Vaughan, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, that was another iconic sort of uh, guest star to appear in that episode as well. Well known uh, at that stage. Yeah. And again, another giggly, funny, great, great guy to work with. You know, they were all nice. You know, they were lo they were very low key. Even Mr. T was a I just remember him being a sweetie. You know, he was polite and nice and welcoming. And, and so was George Papard. And. Um, you know, it's always that thing, you're nervous the first day, especially arriving as a guest star onto a big iconic show like that. Um, it's always that terrifying first day, you never sleep the night before. I mean, you might as well just stay up all night because you're not going to sleep because you're so nervous. And then, you know, you get on the set and within a few hours, it's like a family. Mm. And in terms of uh, working with George Papard, obviously he was the big Hollywood actress. We all know him from uh, Breakfast and Tiffany's. Uh, he appeared in so many iconic uh, movies uh, throughout the 70s. Was, was for you as a budding young actress, was that bit of uh, starstruck in terms of that sort of first day uh, in terms of George Pard? Because obviously he obviously he comes with such a big reputation in terms of the body of work and the volume of work that he had done was there always did you always feel that you were trying to learn and soak up uh, so much that you could take from him in terms of your time being on the show 
Yeah, I mean, again, he he's such a, I've worked, I've been so lucky to work with some amazing actors and he was one of them. And again, he made me feel comfortable. Um, so I, I, I watched what they all did because they were all really good at what they did. Um, and I, I, it's like a sort of a big machine doing a show like that. It's so well oiled, it moves. And, and the actors were very comfortable and very relaxed and very nice. And George was just lovely to me. And actually it was quite a funny moment. I've never forgotten it. I arrived and it was my first day and he thought he, I was wearing this blouse and it was kind of had a shine to it. And he said, Sheila, are you very hot? And I said, oh, no, 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 that's not sweat. That's just, the sh that's the pattern of the blouse. We were giggling like mad. And the, and the wardrobe, are you, do you need to change? And I said, no, it's the pattern. I, I mean, I, I was nervous, but I wasn't sweating. But George Fafar was like so funny about it. And he was laughing and it was, it was great. He was nice. And I suppose for your character, there was that sort of deep reveal sort of scene where you're standing on top of the uh, the fourth story, uh, fourth story suite or with uh, David Bohan and your sort of true identity sort of comes out. But in the flip switch of a minute, you all, throughout your reveal in terms of that, you always show that sort of affection for uh, Templeton. So it's almost like the Stockholm sort of syndrome when you spend so much time with someone, you sort of sort of bound uh, with him. So it's almost like he is sort of warmed his, while you try to warm your way into his affections, that he had warmed his way unknowingly into your affections. Yeah, and it, it's such a nice character, I think, Templeton, because he is a bit of an innocent in a funny way. And, you know, you go along with him and all that stuff when he's he's been have given the pardon. It's it's cute. You know, it's cute stuff. He's a, I hate to say cute because it sounds patronising, but he's a lovely, warm character. And I think, I mean, she she liked him. I think she did like him from the word go, you know, whether she fancied him or not. I don't know, but I think she just really, really took to him. Um, because he has that sort of boyish, boyish innocence in it, a funny way that he was he was so excited to be forgiven and was, you know, his, he was Chucky, he was with Chucky the chicken and doing the show and enjoying his new fame. And there's a sort of sweetness to the role. And I think she was taken by him. And uh, Sheila, in terms of appearing on the episode of The A-Team, and I suppose it released on November the 26th in 1985, and to have that sort of on your resume in terms of your credits and sort of stuff, when your talent agent sort of put you forward for the roles, do you think it was a big help? Because obviously uh, going for further roles down the line when people say you, are, you appeared in The A-Team, and obviously it's a show that is well known and shown globally and it's shown all across the United States and Canada and do you think maybe it was a launching pad for you for further roles uh, during your stint in Los Angeles? I think at that time you know you're a jobbing actor and when you're a jobbing actor you you go up for so many roles and I think later on it was weirdly enough so at the time I just went on to do something else and and it, it became a job but looking back several years later it was it was, people are impressed. They, they were impressed that, you know, this was this iconic show that I'd been in that has lasted for still now, it still has massive fans, um, uh, rightly so. And I think it, 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 I was just proud to be part of it really and have that, you know, small part in it and just happy memories of shooting it and the, the excitement of working in LA and being with a nice group of people who were so professional. And, and then the show lasts, it's, it stood the test of time. And Sheila, I was just speaking to Vince McKeown uh, before I spoke to you and Vince was saying that uh, every time the show comes on in a different country or different continent all across the world for the very first time, obviously it leads to more, he says he has more A-team residual checks each year than any other sort of project. Well, now he said there might not be enough to buy a cup of coffee, but he's still amazed that they're sort of still coming in the letterbox. Is this sort of the same scenario for you? Completely. I mean, you do. I mean, it's great when you first do the show because you still get some nice checks in. But but now I get checks in for like five cents, but I keep them. I keep them. And I just think what what a what a privilege to be in that show. And here's this, and I show my husband, I say, look, Mark, I made some money today. I got five cents and I show him the check of the 18. Right. And uh, it's an honor, really. It's an honor. It's a badge of honor. So I keep them. 
And uh, Sheila, in terms of uh, the A team, obviously you have family and friends and loved ones, and it's all known all across the world. And uh, even for your young uh, sort of who might watch the TV, does it still get a uh, surprise when they see, oh, my aunt was on the A team, my granny was in the A team, and especially when the new movie came out there six or seven years ago, and it was all the big hype around. Uh, cinemas and obviously released in the UK as well were you were you sort of sought in demand for maybe a, talking about your time the A team or well, your... sadly not but the funny thing is um I did I did, I did a very big series of me for a very very long time and whenever I said to the press um oh I also did an episode of the A team they were just like just like kids you know it, it, you know it, it they were so impressed <laughs> yeah. they were in the A-team and I went yeah, they went wow we love that show and these were kind of grown men and women yeah. and the, you know the Times and the Guardian and they were just sort of uh, obsessed with the show and that's the funny thing because yeah. my friends and family have you know I've been an actor for you know 35 years now and so they've seen me quite a lot of stuff but when I showed my husband we watched the A-team the other day and he went he's never seen it and he went oh my god okay you're so young and it's so, it's it's lovely. He loved it. And uh, Sheila, I suppose, lastly, uh, well, penultimate question. I have one more for you after this one. But uh, Sheila, in terms of uh, actually getting to know George Pard and getting to know to Dirk Benedict and spending your time on set on the A-team, uh, one thing that struck me when I watched um, the, the movie with Liam Neeson and... Uh, uh, Rampage Jackson. I couldn't really get to start the same gra gravitas or draw to it. It just seemed something completely alien uh, in terms of it. And was that the sort of same feeling for you? For uh, if you saw, I don't know if you saw the eighteen movie with uh, Liam. Yeah, and yes, yeah. Right. I mean, there's some shows that okay, they you know you can do great you know uh, sequels and. But there's some shows that just for, are forever their own. They're unique. And it's a coming together of the cast and the talent behind the, the camera and the music and the set design and the stunts. And it just sort of works. It's like a kind of alchemy. It's like magic. And I really think that the A-Team series was kind of like a magic. And it also reached a universal audience. So, and that's really rare, I think, for... For a, for a series to actually go round the world and everybody, it appealed to young and old and, you know, people who didn't speak the language. It was, it was a unique, for, a new, unique series. So I think I'll always think it was better. The series was better. I, I don't think many would disagree with that sort of viewpoint either, Sheila. Uh, Sheila, lastly, uh, before I let you go, uh, let's pretend there was an A-team encyclopedia, a sort of dictionary as such, and they put everybody's uh, character into that encyclopedia, sort of, and they left two blank sentences under your character's name, E.G. Fowler, and they got in touch with your uh, talent age and got in touch with you and said, listen, they want a synopsis on E.G. Fowler, two sentences uh, they want to ask you Sheila having portrayed the role the character E.G. Fowler is coming back to them and you having to time to think about her what would you like those two sentences to read? I suppose E.G. Fowler was um, a fun funky um, woman who had a great warmth to her and um, and loved life. Loved life. Yeah. Uh, on that and that sort of simple note, uh, Sheila, you did very well for yourself, and that decision to make that sort of trek down to California is certainly uh, paid off for you. I know that's yeah. for certain. I know. Sheila McLeod, an absolute uh, pleasure talking to you today. Thanks for sharing your memories. You played the one and only E.G. Fowler on season four, episode nine, Mind Games, which aired all across the uh, United States and Canada on cable TV. November the 26th, 1985, and still to this day, 40 years on, it's still airing in some country, maybe this weekend, all around the world. But for the moment, Sheila, take care and um, put your feet up. I will do. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.